Okay, Brett, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, so if you could start a uh, broadcast uh, in three in a few seconds. Two, one. Good day and welcome to Blueprint for Clean Energy, a webinar speaker series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. My name is Anastasia Kirushkina, and I will be your host for today's webinar titled Supporting EV Commercialization with Rebates, Statewide Programs, Vehicle and Consumer Data, and Select Findings. The Blueprint for Clean Energy webinar series invites leading practitioners and industry researchers um, who work in the field of clean energy to talk about the latest opportunities and developments in corporate, nonprofit, and public-private arenas. In today's webinar, our guest, Dr. Brett Williams, will share up-to-date information on markets for electric cars, supportive policies, and resources of data that empower stakeholders to support the transition to sustainable energy. Uh, Dr. Brett Williams is a principal advisor for the Clean Transportation Department at the Center for Sustainable Energy. He is a point person for electric vehicle market research, stakeholder engagement, policy analysis, and business development. Many of his activities are carried out in support of California's uh, 390 million clean vehicle rebate project, for which he leads transparency and evaluation efforts, as well as for related activities in other states. Previously, uh, Dr. Uh, Brett Williams served as a researcher for Amory Lovins at the Rocky Mountain Institute and a postdoctoral scholar at UC Berkeley, as well as an assistant adjunct professor of public policy at UCLA. Brett earned his undergraduate degree um, at um, Pomona College, and he also holds a master's degree in environment and development from Cambridge University, as well as a PhD in transportation technology and policy from UC Davis. Before we begin, I would like to remind our listeners that we welcome any questions you might have, and we will direct those questions to our speaker towards the end of the talk. Please type your questions directly into the Q&A window throughout the presentation. And with that, Dr. Williams, welcome to Blueprint for Clean Energy. Uh, thank you for that invitation, and thanks very much indeed for the introduction. So I will say a bit more about my organization later, but we have a lot to talk about. So let's jump straight in, shall we? All right, the plan for today is to provide an update on the status of electric vehicle market, overview four programs that provide cash rebates for electric vehicle purchase or leases, and then emphasize two aspects of program administration, tracking and evaluation. Now, there are a lot of fun research findings, and I won't have time to present them all, so I've prepared some links to online sources at the end of the slide. Okay, first, let's get started with the electric vehicle market update to make sure we're all on the same page with the latest happenings in the market. What cars are now available, and how are they selling? So what cars are now available? The electric vehicle market is increasingly characterized by choice and product diversity. The 26 products pictured here have all experienced significant sales in 2017. There's nine mid-sized sedans, four large sedans, two wagons, a, a minivan, and six SUVs. Uh, 16 of these vehicles are less than 30,000 after federal and state incentives. And I think depending on the state, three to five of them are actually under 20,000 after federal and state incentives. Uh, in fact, the pictures are arranged from least expensive to most expensive for each product category. Those product categories being plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, uh, all battery electric vehicles, and fuel cell electric vehicles. Now, there will be some fuel cell data that crops up in the presentation that will not be the emphasis today, but I do have a background in that technology and I'm happy to answer questions about them. Most of what we'll be talking about are these two plug-in electric vehicles, and I'll use the term EV loosely to refer to that, sometimes referred to as PEV. Okay. There's no such thing as range anxiety for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, or PHEV. Most of them go over 300 miles, some up to 640 miles when full. And if you forget to plug them in, they act simply as efficient gasoline vehicles. But as I like to say, the more you plug, the less you chug. And considering that average commutes are 15 miles each way, and average daily driving 30 miles per day, 
many of these products can provide an electric driving experience. The prices range from 27,000 for the Prius Prime on up to the supercar prices and performance of the BMW i8. And all of the products above the black line are less than $40,000 before incentive. Manufacturer suggested retail price. So on the other hand, all of the miles provided by these products are electric. And most vehicles are EPA rated between 100 and 200 miles per full charge, but that goes to up to over 300 miles for some Teslas. And indeed, those miles can be provided quite quickly. Uh, when you consider that in what Tesla calls ludicrous mode, a Tesla can go from zero to 60 in 2.3 seconds. That's faster than a lot of stock Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Uh, that's quite a fun driving experience. And it's all a result of electric motors, which provide full torque at the green light whereas combustion engines require a little bit of revving up to get going. Here are six of the eight recent releases over the past year. A little more detail arranged again from least expensive to most expensive, which interestingly lines them up roughly most efficient to least efficient. I'll draw your attention to the two products in the middle. One is a plug-in hybrid minivan, the first in what I'll call the postmodern era of electric vehicle commercialization. The other is a long range battery electric vehicle, the Chevy Bolt with a V like boy. And that has an EPA rated range of 238 miles uh, and is offered less than $40,000 before incentives and less than $30,000 after incentives. Both of those represent new product categories that are emerging. So how are these vehicles selling? By the end of the year last year, there were over half a million on American roads. And that represented 2% of all light duty vehicle sales in the 10 states that have zero emission vehicle or ZEV regulations. Uh, that includes trucks and vans. And when you consider most EV products are not trucks and vans, and you just look at new car sales, that number bumps up to about 3% or even 5% in some states like California. That's about a 29% increase over 2015. Uh, all told, the market is evenly split between plug-in hybrids and all battery electric vehicles. Indeed, most people don't realize that the best-selling electric vehicle is a plug-in hybrid, the Chevy Volt with a V like Victor. And until recently, Tesla actually was not a leader in sales volumes, but of course they have tremendous momentum and that's very fitting of, a, of an electric vehicle because as we know, momentum is a vector product of mass and velocity and Tesla has both, both literally and figuratively. Here is a, a, a map of market share. So in California, it's over 3% even including trucks and vans. Now, Connecticut, if this were an absolute sales heat map, Connecticut would pale in comparison to its neighbors. But one of the themes of this talk is the use of appropriate comparisons. So normalized to the size of its new car market, Connecticut rates quite well amongst its Northeast neighbors, a little bit behind the Northwest and actually in the anomaly that is Georgia. And Georgia is a, a case study of supportive policies that were reversed which pulled the rug out from underneath the market in Georgia, but not before quite a few leaps were sold down south. So I have select takeaways at the end of each subsection. Sometimes I'll dwell on them, sometimes I won't. These slides are all available for your reference. So don't worry if some of them go by a little too quickly. Long story short, two product types. One has no worries about range. The other has no combustion or tailpipe emissions. The diversity of choices is increasing. There's 22 vehicles that may be bigger than you realize. 16 models, which may be less expensive than you realize, and a couple of new product categories are emerging. By the end of March, uh, probably over 600,000 electric vehicles on the road. Consumers are no longer guinea pigs. They're driving second and third generation technology. Okay, so the first 10 minutes or so was an investment into getting us all on the same page so that we understand the case study that is one policy option for supporting markets for electric vehicles statewide EV rebate programs. And before we dive into kind of the uh, uncharted territory of research and discovery, uh, let's overview those programs to make sure we have an understanding of what we're talking about. Why rebates? How do the rebate programs compare? And what are some of the features that we think lead to success? So this is where I step back and do say a little bit more about my organization. The Center for Sustainability is a nonprofit mission-driven organization that is involved in a lot of clean energy areas. We're focusing on clean transportation today, for which I'm the principal advisor, but we administer programs, for example, for solar programs and storage programs. 
We provide program administration, but also technical expertise and education and outreach. Within the Clean Transportation Department, most of the activities relate to electric vehicles, much of it to do with the administration of incentives, statewide incentives, but also regional incentives like the clean fuel incentive being passed on to consumers in SoCal Edison utility, utility territory. We do outreach both as a part of those programs, but also independently. We host a clean city. We've done quite a bit of regional readiness planning for advanced vehicles in two contrasting areas of California in particular, one, San Diego, and two, the Central Valley of California, which is a more rural community and presents different challenges and a different EV market context. We've also done some research into the second life use of batteries and the formation of a demand clearinghouse that allows consumers to benefit from allowing their vehicle to be controlled by smart charging and therefore providing benefits to the grid. Okay, having said that, you understand why I'm gonna overview the following rebates just as soon as I give you a little bit more motivation. So as well as electric vehicle sales are going, and indeed it's unprecedented in kind of the clean transportation space, had a really strong month in January, we've got a long way to go to achieve goals like 15% by 2025, which are the goals the 10 zero emission vehicle regulation states have set out for themselves. And that sort of is consistent with an overtime compliance with those regulations. If we take it to the uh, Constitution state specifically, we can see by the end of the year last year, there were over 5,000 vehicles on Connecticut roads. Uh, a long way to go to the 150,000 vehicle goal that the uh, land of city habits has set for itself. So what can we do to help this? Let's take a look at the EV rebate programs. Here are the two. First two we'll talk about, the one in California, the CVRP program, and the one in Massachusetts, or the MORE EV program. And you can see the rebate amount each technology type gets. Very recently in California, the legislature required that there be income criteria as a part of consumer eligibility for the program. So that includes both an income cap that excludes high income participants and an increased rebate for low income, low to moderate income participants, which adds $2,000 to the number you see in blue here. Uh, most of them. The Massachusetts program takes a different approach to equity, and it's, it's certainly a, an approach that's much easier to implement. We don't have to collect tax documents from consumers in Massachusetts because the eligibility is based on vehicles and their price. It has what I would call a, a soft MSRP cap, which is the rebate is reduced for high-priced vehicles. In Connecticut, the MSRP cap is hard. High-priced vehicles are excluded from receiving a rebate. Further, the Connecticut program uh, the rebate is based on the size of the battery in the vehicle, whereas the brand new program in New York, the rebate is based on a little bit more of a performance metric, the EPA rated electric range of the vehicle. In both cases, the consumer can experience a point of sale discount to their vehicle. In Connecticut, by assigning the consumer rebate to the dealer at the point of sale, in New York, the dealer actually has to submit the uh, application for the consumer. And last but not least, the Connecticut has a, another innovative feature in addition to some very um, large rebate size, you know, clear policy signals. It also has a $300 dealer incentive to motivate the sales or leases on the side of the dealership. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so I'm gonna flash this next slide. It's a little complicated, but I'll just say from the point of view of the consumer, the consumer side of these programs, simplicity is king. And We'll talk more about that in a minute. We're gonna sort of peer into the implications of these rebate designs from more of a policy analyst perspective. So here is the Connecticut program based on battery size from smallest to largest battery at the bottom. There are essentially three technology buckets. And within two of those buckets, there's kind of the Neapolitan approach to supporting more impactful vehicles with larger rebates. So a doubling of the rebate as you uh, move up in bins that are determined to be more and more impactful for the state of Connecticut. This allows you to uh, incentivize plug-in hybrid electric vehicles at an impactful level, as well as all battery electric. One thing I'll note is battery size is not strictly correlated to electric range performance, and that's because the vehicle platform efficiency varies, and that depends on how big the vehicle is, how massive the aerodynamic, how the drivetrain is tuned for performance. And as we talked about in the first section, there's a wide diversity of products emerging. And so that's what decoupling that relationship between battery size and electric range. Now, here is a program that's based on electric range, the brand new New York program. 
that just has one bucket for all technologies, but several bins that allow more impactful vehicles to receive larger regions. And again, these are available for reference later. We're going to explore that a little bit more uh, in the next section. So here's kind of the, the wrap up summary of these programs. The state agency on behalf of whom we administer the rebate, the inception date from oldest to newest, the amount of funds diverse and the number of vehicles uh, supported ranging from 180,000 to just a couple hundred in the brand new New York program so far just launched. Uh, and as I left the halls of academia where I was free to contemplate sort of optimal policy design and join the ranks of implementation, I've really noticed the acute importance of simplicity and consistency, particularly in funding cycles. And so you can see a diversity of, op of options throughout these states. So the California program is an annual funding cycle, and often that annual funding cycle is disrupted, for example, by the difference between budget approval and budget allocation. Uh, whereas the New York program recently launched uh, came up with a multi-year commitment to launch its program. Payment in some states goes out in the form of check and other states goes out in the form of electric, uh, electronic reimbursement, particularly to the dealers for those dealers offering point of sale discounts on the deal. Okay, so what programs or program components do we think lead to success? And this is important because in contrast to a tax benefit, a rebate program does have the opportunity to be more comprehensive and have uh, a nice round set of program components that start with creating awareness for the program. So there have been some tax benefit programs in the past in states that weren't well known and therefore didn't have a lot of uptake and some of them were canceled. Uh, and indeed, even for those that are relatively well known, the uptake for low to moderate income consumers tends to be a little bit lower. So I did a calculation and I think there, if you count the consumers who make $100,000 or less per year, in the California rebate program are roughly twice the number of consumers that participated in the federal tax benefit program. Um, once you've created awareness for the programs through coordinated and strategic outreach and education, uh, it's important, and this is really the bread and butter, the core of it, to facilitate participation with just really good uh, customer service. Um, we'll talk about automated rebate processing and really ushering folks through the simplest possible application that we can provide them in a reliable way, enthusiastic way, indeed, uh, because we are a mission-driven organization. Uh, last but not least, uh, the area I primarily work in providing uh, program transparency through tracking and evaluation. Okay, the outreach components are really three-pronged. Dealership, new car buyers, and a focus on disadvantaged communities and low to moderate consumers, which we collectively call underserved communities. So dealerships are critical, especially in those states that involve point of sale discounts. Uh, we train, provide collateral, and engage in partnerships with uh, manufacturers, with dealer associations, with auto groups, and with dealer, dealerships individually. Here are some of the examples of the outreach activities we do to kind of the low hanging fruit of the market, the core new car shopper, which may have a proclivity and ability to adopt an electric vehicle through attending events, per, providing physical and digital materials and cross-program collaboration. Our outreach targeted to underserved communities, again, they're based on income or based on a criteria such as in California, there's a, an index which establishes which communities are called disadvantaged communities based on a composite index of their exposure to pollution on the one hand and their socioeconomic vulnerability on the other hand. And the key to this collaboration, or this form of outreach, is collaboration with community-based organizations and agencies that serve and know those local populations well, providing you know, uh, collaborative education, but also targeted content and multilingual resources. Speaking of multilingual resources, let's get to the application and its processing. So simplicity and accessibility are the key. Uh, you go to the website, pick your vehicle, it tells you how much you're eligible for. We try to make you fill out an application that is as minimal as possible, about 12 required fields. You're ushered through the submission of supporting documents online or via email or via mail or walk in if you want to. Um, all aimed at just proving who you are, is who you say you are, uh, what you bought is what you said you bought, and where you live is where you say you live. And so, these automated processes make the 
application process very simple, but it also free, frees support staff to sort of usher uh, consumers through the process wherever help is needed or whether wherever they get tripped up along the way. So this customer service is something that it's really kind of a point of pride in joining a nonprofit that does this. Sort of really a mission-driven uh, market transformation motivation. Okay, last but not least, the area that I work most directly in is transparency. And the goal of this is to empower both internal and external stakeholders with information. So if I step back into a, an academic view of the policy process, you can see that uh, generally policies create a rough outline of a program and that's filled up in the design phase and then in the planning phase, the funding is secured. And then the magic that is implementation happens. And along the way, there's some visibility uh, on these programs to external stakeholders. Well, how does that happen? It happens through two activities, tracking and evaluation. So tracking collects the data, evaluation provides the advisement that informs either internal teams on the design, planning, and implementation of the programs, or external stakeholders. And that could be so that it helps them improve the program, or it helps them transform the market in each in their own way by providing data publicly available, free, up to date. So again, internal advisement and external advisement. Okay, so this is the, the summary of, of that section. I think at this point it's good for me to step away and let the Yale host uh, update those of you who may have joined the webinar a little bit later on. Thank you. Um, the listeners who are just joining us, uh, we are speaking with Dr. Brett Williams. So far we have covered electric vehicle market update and reviewed statewide, uh, statewide rebate programs in Connecticut, California, Massachusetts, and New York. Uh, in the second part of our webinar, Dr. Williams will dive into program tracking and evaluation and discuss select program findings that provide insight into the implementation and improvement. Uh, then we will pose questions to him for the Q&A uh, session of our webinar. Please continue to type your questions into the chat box uh, in, in your webinar window. Thank you. Excellent. So on to program tracking. So what data are publicly available that are produced by these programs? So here are eight online graphical interactive dashboards that we provide as a part of our administration on behalf of state agencies in California, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, as well as a 50 state VEV sales dashboard that was developed in collaboration with the Automotive Alliance, which is a, an interesting collaboration based on a shared desire for informed and strategic decision making. So I'm gonna give you a drive by of the three California tools for illustration. The first is the rebate dashboard, which characterizes at this point over 180,000 vehicles and nearly $400 million of incentives. This data can be sliced and diced according to time, consumer and vehicle type, and a lot of geography. So that could be an assembly district, that could be utility, territory, and so forth. We've got a notes page to help you understand the data, and the data is updated monthly with a little bit of a lag so that the data settles and is of high quality. And last but not least, you can download the data into Excel. Now that data also powers a rebate map, which allows you to search for a place like say Fresno, California, on this absolute heat map of where the rebates are going, it looks kind of middle of the road, but as one of our points for this talk and one of our themes is appropriate comparisons, if we normalize that comparison, or we normalize the number of rebates by dividing by the size of the new car market, actually Fresno's EV market share is comparable to Los Angeles. So if you do search for Fresno and you zoom in to the neighborhood level or census tract level, you can see where the cars are and where the money is going, which can be valuable for a variety of uses. We also have a survey dashboard Currently online, there are over 19,000 responses representing over 91,000 program participants. The majority, about three quarters of the market in California at that time period. And you can look at a lot of issues related to their adoption experience. So their demographics, the information channels they were exposed to and found important, their purchase motivations. Also what enabled the purchase to happen in the first place, their dealership experience and so forth. Lots of filters to help you slice and dice, focus on disadvantaged communities, for example, and you can download that data as well. This is actually just one of six surveys that are a part of these programs so far. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of them, but there's some reference here for you in the future. 
Okay, so the takeaways are the data is available. We like to make it public, up to date, and that empowers a lot of stakeholders to engage in different ways. So what are the learnings that are accumulating in reports and presentations based on this program data? These are the products of program evaluation, internal and external, uh, internal focus and external focus, all done by the program administrator in this case. Um, a lot of the questions that we will be exploring uh, are shown here. In fact, there's many more. I'll probably touch on about half of these, but this gives you an indication and some links to follow up. So let's jump into rebate impact. So before I get into it, there's, there's a common stereotype of the EV adopter, that they are rich, with rich white males who buy EVs as toys and don't use them very much, and therefore they don't accumulate a lot of environmental or other social benefits. So we're going to present some evidence that is pertinent to various aspects of this assumption and see how it holds up or where it doesn't. The first thing we can say is that EVs are not just toys put in garages. They are replacing older, more polluting vehicles about three quarters of the time across three different states. Uh, we think about 90% of the time these vehicles are the primary vehicles in households. Indeed, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles replace older vehicles at a slightly higher rate, almost 80% across the three states. So are these rebates influential? Uh, this is data representing, again, those 91,000 participants in California through about mid-2015. 97% of which said the rebate was important in making it possible for you to acquire the EV in the first place. Now, 70, about three quarters said it was very or extremely important. And I should say that uh, this is a higher rating than the other incentives that were again, the federal tax credit and some others. Um, but let's be even more conservative. Let's just look at those people who flat out said, I would not have purchased or leased my vehicle without the rebate. These represent the true additions to the market who have been induced by the rebate to buy an EV. So a large percentage of participants have that kind of clear cut view of how the rebate helped enable their purchase. Okay, so I am going to talk about some of the illustrative rebate design recommendations we would make. We've seen some of the existing programs. Now let's talk a little bit more in the abstract. Now optimal rebate design depends on region, the market context, and the program priority. So let me just throw up one example recommended design that embodies a variety of recommendations and has some implications that we can look at. Uh, first, I'll just kind of summarize the type of goals that are common across you know, all the programs we administer. Everybody wants the program to be effective, uh, to provide environmental impact, uh, also to create the market conditions that allow entrance into the EV market, adoption of EVs, so, so that that environmental impact can be realized um, to do this efficiently and from the consumer point of view, as simply and consistently as possible because simple and consistent programs give dealers and consumers confidence and make it easy to participate. Okay, so we'll take, we'll revisit this slide again at the end. What I'm gonna do now is present, again, some of the data that I think supports uh, design recommendations like this, you may disagree, and we'll, we'll see how we end up at the end. Okay, so how big should the rebate be? Well, the research literature is looking at this carefully, econometrically. Unfortunately, the only clear signals that we're seeing are for the larger rebates. Uh, there is a little bit more uncertainty as the rebate size goes down, and indeed, the cheaper data reinforces this. The percent of new additions to the market, those rebate essential consumers, is high for the large rebates. And this is consistent with economic disutility theory. So part of economic disutility is the incremental cost a consumer might have to pay for an EV relative to a conventional vehicle, although we're, we're seeing that there's a wide diversity of prices, some under 20,000. So part of that economic disutility is the incremental cost of the vehicle. The rest of that economic disutility may be the real or perceived uh, inconvenience of a adapting to a new innovation in your life, figuring out how it works for you. And particularly for low and moderate income consumers, uh, overcoming that total economic disutility writ large may require a clear policy signal like a larger rebate. And there's some research at UCLA and other places, I believe UCLA that supports increasing rebates slightly actually can improve program performance. Okay, so there's the idea, of course, that we want to design these programs intelligently with an intentional phase out when they're no longer needed. 
Um, the idea behind the public subsidy is to make up for that economic disutility. And when the incremental cost of the vehicle comes down, you no longer need to compensate for that. Um, so that's the desirable goal. Where are we in terms of what the data show? Well, in Connecticut, uh, the percent of rebate essential consumers is holding pretty steady. So this kind of indicates we're still pretty early in the market and that there's a way to go before intentional phase out should happen, or at least we should worry a little bit about a premature phase out at this point. Could be a little bit. And the reason is in California, the trend is actually the opposite. So the percent of rebate, rebate essential participants is increasing over time. And we think this is because as this uh, chart shows, the need for policy intervention in blue is high at the beginning of a market, but as the market grows over time in black, you can phase out the policy intervention. Well, I think that the, the issue we're seeing now, which is a good problem to have, is the market is growing, but it's growing not just on homogenous consumers, but we're making inroads into more mainstream, more skeptical consumers who actually need more encouragement, not less encouragement, to join the market. So there's that fine balancing act. Okay, let's do a little compare and contrast between supporting equity goals through income criteria or supporting equity goals through vehicle criteria. So on the one hand, we have income criteria. So we're starting with high incomes at the left, low incomes at the right. As you go down in annual household income, the percent of folks who are rebate essential goes up, as you might expect. Well, this is one factor that contributes to the difficulty in setting the right income cap in a program. Clearly, you're, there's a temptation to carve out the highest income folks because there are many more of them who are less influenced by the rebate, they're less rebate essential. But where exactly do you put the cap? And that is made tricky, and there are a lot of program data calculations that we've made, but the long story short is, the lower you make the cap, the higher the potential losses, exclusionary losses caused by the program's restrictions you might cause in the market. So, the far left are those folks with $500,000 annual household income when filing jointly on their taxes. The far right is half of that, $250,000. When, when you cut in half the cap, it actually increases by five-fold the estimated losses to the market. So the reason I've phrased this in terms of through 2022 is because there is a goal in California for there to be a million EVs on the road by 2023. And so this puts in risk, or applies uncertainty to roughly 10% of that number. So we've got to, again, treat that balancing act. There's no you know, clear ledge upon which to hang this income cap. And indeed, the, the losses start accelerating to my eye, at least on this slide, at, at the $400,000 level, which is still you know, considered a high income. But uh, that balancing act between including people in this very young market and making the program equitable and efficient needs to be struck. An alternative way to do this is to look at vehicle price, as I mentioned. So this dark green section, this is the importance of the rebate. It's not exactly the way we just showed it, but it's the folks that are extremely, who rate the rebate as extremely important. These folks are a good proxy for rebate essentials that I've been showing all along. When you divide by vehicle price, you can see that the proportion that are rebate essential or who rate the rebate as extremely important dramatically decreases cuts more than in half compared to those who are buying least, uh, less expensive vehicles. So there is an opportunity to affect the program participation in this way as well. And depending on the priorities of the program, you may or may not want to be collecting tax documents. Okay, the last point I'll make, uh, sorry, this one's a little tech heavy, but I'll talk you through it. This idea that in the Northeast, you may have different considerations in Cal than in California. For so the plug-in hybrid um, represents a a range anxiety-free option, which I mentioned earlier, which makes you less dependent on how built out the infrastructure is. And it also makes you a little bit more cold weather robust. I'll talk about that in a second. So this provides a gateway into zero emission driving. I actually sometimes call it a gateway drug into zero emission driving. Uh, and it's a it appeals to a broader, more diverse base of consumers. Um, even from an environmental point of view, when you look at greenhouse gas reductions, the marginal social return on the public investment in electric range does diminish above average daily driving. Uh, so the benefit you get may not be in reality much better in the near term uh, from a battery electric vehicle, which has a lot more potential to provide environmental benefit than from a plug-in hybrid, which gives you a little bit more confidence to use it more miles per year. So I have this rough rule of thumb that 
allows me to go back and forth between BEV and PHEV range, and it's just something to throw out for fun for you today. So consider an, an all-battery electric vehicle that gets a 100-mile range. There's some research at MIT and I think elsewhere that indicates that cold weather climates taking care of the battery and the, the passengers in those cold weather climates can reduce the range of an electric vehicle, in the extreme case, up to 40 to 50 percent. So let's divide that range in half just to be safe. So that's down to 50 miles range. Then you have this idea of an emergency trip buffer, which I was made aware of at uh, UC Davis. Uh, so that's the, you know, you want to leave something in the tank, so to speak, in order to drive grandma to the hospital or do whatever trip you need to do in an emergency. Subtract 20 miles off that 50 and you've got 30 miles really that you can do whatever you want with to play with, regardless of the weather, regardless of your emergency trip. Well, the plug-in hybrid that offers 30 miles is going to be cold weather robust because you can fall back on the gasoline. And indeed, you have an economic incentive to fully utilize that battery each and every day. So you can kind of go back and forth a little bit that way. You can decide if that's the right calculus for you, or maybe you, you want to add in some other considerations from the research. Okay, so here we are back at that illustrative design uh, that I showed earlier. And I'll just leave it with the simple question, which is, have I provided evidence for this design? Does this design support priorities in your region? Uh, Let's talk about it in the question and answers or follow up with us after. And again, this is just one of many ways to embody these recommendations and learnings that we're finding in the research, but also importantly from the program data themselves. Okay, so I think I need to uh, wrap it up. I'm going to do two sections. One is going to be a quick, uh, I, I think I'm okay. I don't need to wrap it up quite yet, but two quick sections nonetheless. One is going to focus on the dealer incentive, so not the consumer incentive, but the dealer incentive. We're just about to release this report, and so I'll just give you a teaser. We asked dealership employees how essentially motivating the, the dealer incentive was, the $300 per vehicle sold or leased. And first, we just asked dealerships as a whole. And on all behaviors uh, examined, they rated the incentive as moderately to very important, particularly those for um, preparing and submitting cheaper applications. So the time spent participating in the program, making a point of sale consumer rebate, is kind of compensated for by the dealer incentive. And this points to sort of perhaps the less intuitive benefit of the dealer incentive, which is dealership buy-in as a whole. In fact, a lot of the dealerships, 69% of respondents said that none of the dealer incentive was passed on to the salesperson specifically. Uh, for those that were aware of the rebate, the individual motivation, I'm sorry, the dealer incentive, the individual motivation that that incentive provided was again moderately to very motivating as seen in blue here. Interestingly, ownership played a very important role, not just in perception of EVs. Of course, there's another slide that shows how folks that own EVs have a better perception of EVs, but also in the motivation that they attributed to the incentive. So this presents the opportunity to, for example, experiment with giving salespeople more pseudo ownership experiences like extended EV loans, and that might increase the effectiveness of the dealer incentive itself. Okay. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that if you take these two slides and kind of combine them, it kind of presents an opportunity for an interesting split incentive design experiment. One is say spending about 200, and, uh, this is a reminder for me to wrap up here soon. Uh, one is to say apply $250 of the incentive to the dealership to increase buy-in. The other would be to apply $250 to the salesperson themselves. And of course, we have another chart that says the more of the rebate that the um, that the salesperson receives themselves, the more motivating it is. Um, so perhaps that split incentive design is the next opportunity for an experiment. Okay. So the last thing I'll do is I'll just talk about who's participating and what we can do to expand that participation. So this gets to that stereotype that I mentioned earlier. Let's look at who has participated so far. In fact, these were the early enthusiasts through about 2015. Uh, most of them are 40 to 60 highly educated white males that live in single family homes and have you know, moderate to good uh, income. Now, of course, this is not Californian as is the case here. But keep in mind, the theme of the talk is appropriate basis of comparison. So if you compare that to new car buyers specifically, a lot of those differences disappear. The one difference that really is maintained is the survey respondents, and therefore we think the EV adopters really are predominantly male, whereas the new car market is obviously more split. 
Uh, but interestingly, the, the rebate recipients are already a little bit less frequently white, and they have similar, more comparable incomes than you might expect. So how can we expand this, nevertheless, into more diverse, more mainstream consumers? And this gets to my last slide, and then I'll wrap up, which is, I like to mix metaphors. Sometimes I do it at the beginning of the talk and sometimes at the end. But I think there are at least three ways that program data can inform strategic outreach to consumers. We call this adding fuel to the fire, tough nuts to crack, and expanding uh, the frontiers of the EV market. So the first strategy is basically understanding who is already adopted, finding more people like that to reinforce what is already working. This would be uh, the low hanging fruit. Um, you can either do that demographically or based on sort of their ability, their pre-adapted ability to adopt an EV. Say they have a garage at home where they can easily plug in. On the other hand, the second goal is to identify folks who may have a proclivity to adopt EVs, but face some kind of barrier. And how can we break down those barriers through policy or other? And then the last approach is to say, okay, let's look at those consumers that aren't just in, you know, let's think outside of the tinderbox of enthusiastic EV consumers and look at the more mainstream margins. Who are those folks that have adopted an EV but represent more of an expansion of the frontiers? And we've actually done some uh, research with Ford Logistics Regressions looking at two different types of consumers, those that are rebate essential, which we've talked about, and those that have a low initial interest in EVs, but they go on to adopt, which I call converts. And that really brings me back to the beginning. So it was the presentation of that research specifically, which led to my invitation to speak to you today. But it also brings us back to the beginning of a comprehensive, well-designed rebate project to support the electric vehicle market which is the purpose of this talk. Uh, so creating awareness, ideally in a very strategic way that maximizes cost effectiveness, and again, provides supportive resources, whether it's information or whether it's uh, incentive themselves, to those folks who are on the fence and we can nudge in to join the EV market and expand it to the mainstream. Okay, so with that, I will thank you for your attention through a whirlwind of topics. I've got some slides that I'll just quickly flash through that are linked that you can follow up later. You don't need to read them now. Various research and raw data. And I will thank you very much for your time and attention. And please do let us know if we can help. Thanks. Brad, thank you so much for all those insights. Uh, we do have quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, and I would like to start well, with the rebates uh, financing question. Uh, we understand that California's clean vehicle rebate project is uh, largely funded by California climate investments. So all uh, the proceeds from the state and uh, the state's cap and trade auctions. Uh, what about um, other states? And what is the business case for for the states to provide rebates? Is there a return on investment? And if so, how would you quantify it? Okay, so let me find the slide. There actually was a funding sources row here that I skipped quickly over. So you are correct. The program in California started based on registration fees, and the demand kind of outgrew that originally legislative uh, program, which originally was H-118 and now 88, I believe. And it's switched over to being funded primarily by the revenues from cap and trade proceeds. Um, in other states, Reggie, Clean Energy Fund, and a utility sediment. So Eversource is a funder of, of this Medicaid program, for example. The return on investment, of course, depends on how you calculate it, you know, how much of the social benefits you include and how much of the private benefits you include. So there are efforts to uh, compare and contrast the benefits of the program, starting just with the basic output. Where is the money going? What are the number of vehicles that are being induced into the market? More specifically, what portion of those vehicles would not have been you know, bought without the rebates themselves. There's also efforts to attach greenhouse gas estimates onto those vehicles and how they're being used and put that into the calculus. And last but not least, at least of the cost benefit analysis that I know, there's also an assessment of sort of the job impact of these investments. So depending on where the money goes, it could support the automakers, it could support the consumer income, which then has local impacts. Generally, moving investment away from fuels, which are labor inintensive, not very labor intensive, and tend to be outside of the community. Investments in you know, consumer welfare uh, are more job intensive uh, and provide more community benefit. So that gives you an idea of the type of cost benefit analysis that I'm on. 
Thank you for that. Uh, would you say that having a small set, uh, small set quantity of high value rebates is more effective than a large quantity of low to medium value rebates? Uh, what steps um, should a state take to determine optimal rebate allocations? It's a, it's a great question of balance. Uh, I think some of what I talked about today points you to the cautionary edges of the map beyond which there may be dragons in the form of if the rebate gets too small, it may be less effective. That's not to say if that's what the program can afford, you shouldn't do it. Uh, but certainly I saw some re research for gasoline hybrid vehicles, not for plug-in vehicles, that indicated below $1,000 a vehicle incentive can be less effective. And you can intuitively kind of think of that as, well, what are, what are the taxes and fees and other things that might be the noise in that transaction that might make that rebate amount more or less psychologically significant? You can think about the percentage reduction in the cost of the vehicle. You can think about the amount of the relative incremental cost that that rebate buys down. So the idea is, you know, in, in a utopia, you would have large rebates and just run those off the cliff and incentivize as many vehicles as you can. And you're more likely to include more diverse consumers in those purchases. As the rebates get a little bit smaller, there's just some risk that it's less effective and there's some risk that it doesn't quite shine for certain diverse consumers. And so it is fundamentally a balancing act. And that's a conversation, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of this is optimal design and then the reality of program planning and budgeting. And that's usually the priority of most programs. Yes, it's always finding that, uh, you know, the golden middle, I guess, um, and it's always a challenge. Um, so our next question is, um, what do you think uh, emerging economies can learn from developed economies in terms of growing markets for electric vehicles? Oh, that's a good question. Now, I didn't wear crim crimson, so I thought you'd take it easy on me today. Um, <laughs> uh, so what can, I think, you know, it's hard to translate policy context. It's a little bit easier to translate market context. I think uh, at the basic level, some of the top level takeaways are, comparison of different policy options. The disadvantage of a rebate program is that the cost of that program are up front. The tax benefit program, the costs are still there, they're still the same, but they're a little bit more hidden. They are, tend to be displaced into things like general funds. So if you can come up with a program that can provide multi-year consistent funding to at least get started, then you have the opportunity to do some of the things I recommend, which is surround that core, which is application processing and money transfer, with consumer awareness, with tra transparency and data provision, which then unlocks a lot of different things throughout the ecosystem of stakeholders trying to make the, the uh, market happen. And that's one of the things, you know, we constantly get asked by local governments, uh, you know, how many EVs are in my state? I'm doing this exercise where I'm promoting free parking or I'm creating codes and standards and your data will help me, you know, figure out, you know, what's the scale of the issue in, in my region. And so a lot of what I focus on is that sort of the value of the data in informing other external stakeholders. What a, a lot of the other folks focus on here is creating awareness. Awareness is a big problem right now. Um, the, under, the awareness of EVs and the understanding of them, in particular PHEVs, is relatively low. And so a lot of effort is being focused on outreach efforts. And then last but not least is that sort of customer service. You got to make it accessible so that a wide diversity of folks can, can participate and you you know, ideally give them really good customer service to make, make it succeed. And I think those are all universal messages to some extent. Thank you. Yes, I mean, information asymmetries are definitely uh, huge in, in that particular um, application. So uh, what do you see as the role of private sector to further expand access to uh, BEVs, especially for undeserved communities? What are the key gaps that need to be filled to serve those communities? And should the financial sector be more involved, in your opinion? I think there are, there is a move towards an increasing focus and interest on financing. So you have the purchase itself, you can reduce the incremental cost of that purchase. But even if you reduce the incremental cost of that purchase to an affordable level, not everybody has access to the same amount of capital and credit. And so the next major frontier is reducing the cost of that purchase, but then providing that access to that capital or credit. So whether that's through you know, loan loss reserves or risk mitigation, I think there's a lot of interest in developing those programs moving forward. I think uh, BEVs, 
very interestingly, uh, you know, we do have a new product class, which is a more affordable long range BEV specifically. I will say that there is a slight, and I have a slide on this, I think I could pull up. Um, there is a slight uh, distribution towards plug in hybrid electric vehicles in low income and rural communities. So when you cut, slice, and dice those data for disadvantaged communities or low to moderate income consumers, they do adopt plug-in hybrids more frequently. And that can be to help them overcome certain barriers. So that could be residents in a multi-unit dwelling. It could be income. Uh, it could be a variety of factors. And so if you can address those barriers uh, for your BEV, then you can help them overcome that as well. So a lot of that has to do with multi-unit dwelling, charging access, for example. Financing, charging access are, are two big pieces of that puzzle. And the charging access is not uniformly distributed throughout those communities. Thank you. Uh, we do have uh, a lot of questions from the audience today. Uh, unfortunately, we only have time to get through a couple more. Uh, Brad, as a part of your research, do you plan to examine the impact of electric utility EV rebates and electric utility EV SE rebates? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. One is we are just launching, I think, this next Tuesday, a program that provides essentially the low carbon fuel standard credit benefit that accrues to the utility Southern California Edison in Los Angeles to owners of electric vehicles in Los Angeles. So that's one example where the, the policy network, you know, the zero emission vehicle sales requirements or production requirements meets the fuel, uh, low carbon fuel standard and the decarbonization of fuel, fuel policies. And so that program represented an opportunity to pass on value to the consumer. Uh, you know, doing a regional rebate for electric vehicles. We also do that in Sonoma County. Uh, they provide a regional rebate that was uh, conducted in collaboration with a bulk purchase discount. So certain dealerships signed up and the manufacturers allowed them to provide a bulk purchase discount. You get to sign up for a voucher, you bring a, a, a regional rebate to that puzzle as well as the state rebate. And we're seeing it's very effective, particularly in disadvantaged communities, to stack up rebates and incentives of different kinds. So that could be a retirement and replacement incentive, and it could be this extra regional kicker. Um, last but not least, there was another part of that question, but maybe for the, you can either repeat it or move on to the next question as the host desires. Yeah, let's move on, on to the next question, uh, a very quick one. Uh, do you happen to have any information on whether availability of workplace charging stations uh, helps to motivate sales of electric vehicles? So there certainly is a, is a lot of anecdotal evidence to the point it's almost taken as a given truth. And I'm not sure who studied this, you know, strictly econometrically, but there is this kind of, if you build it, they will come aspect to workplace charging. In other words, as workplace charging is installed, it tends to be highly utilized very quickly. And the idea behind this is that it's the workplace parking lot acts as a second showroom of sorts. So you're seeing colleagues you know who have some similarity to you in some sense using a product that maybe you didn't understand and getting a benefit from it, you know, charging at work. And so that makes the, the technology, A, you're more aware of it, but B, it makes it more valid and adoptable. And so there is a lot of, I think, evidence that could be brought to bear that shows that second showroom effect exists. And there certainly is a top priority that's being placed on workplace charging in particular is the top priority outside of the residence. Um, I don't know if it's more for an, an individual question to answer via email, but are you familiar with any good resources for consumers that compare performance and operating cost trade-offs of electric vehicles and uh, PE, uh, PHEVs? So, yeah, let me. This is not the sexiest one, but let me go ahead and show you one that I skipped over, which is this idea of figuring out which EVs are right for me. So mm -hmm. consider this to be the, the more techy website but it's the Department of Energy's fueleconomy.gov, and it allows you to compare the specs of all vehicles, not just advanced vehicles. But what I suggest is you go to this and you go to their power search and you select the advanced vehicles, then you throw in your personal preferences. So if you're only interested in you know, upscale sedans, just click that button, put a maximum price and see what you get. And it'll actually produce a list. And that list will do annual fuel costs, it'll do specs, it'll do manufacturer, uh, retail prices. So for example, for plug-in hybrids, 
these are, you know, no preferences uh, in terms of market class or price. These are just the top six most efficient plug-in hybrids that pop up if you limit your search to that. And these tabs, when you click the names, will give you more spec, you know, based on my like, price and, and performance. And this is in comparison to the most efficient gasoline and electric vehicles. Now, we are seeing more sexy, more consumer-oriented versions of this. This is very useful. Uh, for example, I believe Southern Company has a great website that, you know, one of the questions it asks you is, are you a Ford or a GM person? And so it really kind of gets more to the psychological aspects of car buying. Um, and so we're seeing a lot more of those resources pop up. Uh, great. Uh, I will ask you one final question. Uh, how different do you think that rebates would be if they considered benefits to uh, to the environment and public health as opposed to uh, incentives for for the EV market penetration? Uh, I think you know that's a question of do you set the the rebate amount based on strict uh, sort of calculations of cost? Do you balance it strictly from cost, or do you set it more in terms of effectiveness? And so I think, you know, the most clear examples of effectiveness are in places where the rebates are large. I, I think, you know, for example, I have another slide that I didn't show here that relates to uh, an example in Vancouver compared to another part of, of uh, uh, Canada where there was a rebate, then they took away the rebate in one region, and then they added it back in another region. And just for the sake of time, I won't go through that. But those are pretty high Canadian level uh, incentives. You're seeing significant impact in Norway where the tax benefit of uh, EVs is tremendous because the purchase price is you know, half tax, if you will. And so I think there is an issue of calibrating it to carefully calculated social return on investment. And then there's this issue of effectiveness. And then again, it's a balancing act. I don't think we're too far off the mark with the larger rebate. Thank you, Brett. Um, we are out of time for today. Uh, this concludes today talk, uh, today's talk on supporting electric vehicles commercialization with rebates. Brett, thank you once again uh, for joining us today. We would also like to thank the Blueprints audience for all your questions. We will forward any remaining questions to our speaker. Uh, to view a recording of this webinar, please visit the events tab on the Yale Center for Business and the Environment website or access the recording through the Yale iTunes University podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, this was Anastasia Kirushkina from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Thank you very much. We've got some Yale Easter eggs on the board over here. <laughs>